Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In this episode, we're going to explore the question, should we just forget bonds and put everything in stocks? It's a question that's come up recently in the comments, particularly in response to some of the videos on dividends and comparing dividends to interest. And the thought is, look, interest is so low, why even bother? Let's just go all in. So here's what we're going to do in today's video. We're first gonna look at a 100% stock portfolio from the perspective of younger folks who have decades to go uh, before they retire. Does it make sense for you all? Then we're gonna look at it uh, from the context of older folks like me who are either uh, near retirement or even in retirement. Does it actually make sense? Is it ever a good idea to have 100% stocks? We're gonna look at a study that's actually, I think, gonna be surprising to you. At least it, it was to me. So that's what we're gonna do. And let's get right to it. I wanna begin uh, by showing you something from Vanguard that we've looked at before. This is uh, data going back to 1926 that Vanguard's put together. And it looks at the uh, average annual return of different portfolios. You can see they begin with a portfolio of 100% bonds. It's averaged, uh, what, they're 6.1%. That's its average return. So let's scoot all the way down to 100% stocks. And it, of course, has the highest return at 10 point, try that again, 10.3. That's been its average return, pretty significantly above even an 80-20 portfolio, 9.8. Uh, I think we know from compounding that uh, a half a percent over you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of investing, particularly for you younger uh, folks, is huge, huge. And you look at that return and you think, golly, I mean, why not? Why bother with bonds if I've got decades to go before I'm ever going to need the money? And at one level, I can't argue with that. Uh, but before we dive into a 100% stock portfolio, I think there's a couple of things you need to keep in mind. The first is you're likely to have some pretty ugly years. Now here, they're looking at this on an annual basis. So the worst year, uh, a calendar year, for an all stock portfolio uh, was 1931. Yes, a long time ago in the midst of the Great Depression, two years after the big stock market crash of 1929 and stocks lost 43%. And by the way, to make matters worse, they lost a lot in 29, 30, and 32 as well. It wasn't just 31. 31 just happened to be the worst year of those four, but they were basically down 90% over four years, give or take. So uh, yeah, that's that's a big, uh, that'll leave a mark, as I like to say. And so the question you have to ask is, even if you've got whatever, 30, 40 years to retire, can you handle that kind of loss? now? Yes, it's possible we'll never see, at least in our lifetimes, a, a repeat of 1929 to 1932. Then again, maybe we will, right? And uh, so that's the first question you have to ask yourself uh, before you, you jump into the deep end of the pool and go 100% stocks. And, and by the way, this is looking at the worst on a calendar year basis. If you go back to 08 into 09, I think it hit bottom around March. I think we were down over 50%. So that wasn't on a calendar year basis, but we've had some really ugly markets and you're going to have to live through those and watch your portfolio uh, drop. Can you do that? That's the big question, because I think the worst thing you can do is go 100 percent stocks. And then when things start to get ugly, change in the middle of it and, and, and bail. I think you'd be better off with with a more conservative portfolio, in my my opinion. That's the first thing you should consider. Uh, for long-term investors before you jump into a 100% stock portfolio. The second thing, and I'm moving over to Portfolio Visualizer, and we're going to run a couple of scenarios. Uh, we're going to start, we'll just use the whole U.S. stock market, and we'll do 100%. Uh, and then I want to compare that to one that is got some bonds. So we'll use, uh, let's see here, we'll use intermediate term treasuries. So Portfolio 1 is 100% stocks. Now, again, this is U.S. stock market. If you were going to do 100% stock portfolio, if I were going to do that, I would have international stocks, emerging markets, probably some REITs, some small cap. Well, I guess U.S. stock market has small cap, but I would have a more diversified portfolio. But I think for our purposes, uh, this is good enough. We're going to put uh, for portfolio two a 90-10 portfolio. And let's just start there. So if we analyze this portfolio, we're looking from 
January 72 to June 2021. And we would expect, you know, the stock portfolio to outperform it. And sure enough, it has. You know, it's not a huge difference given that we're talking, what, 50 years. Uh, but it's a difference, right? I mean, I'd rather have 1.6 million than, than 1.4 or 1.5. I'm sure you would too. Um, you know, the max drawdown, 50%, this is probably 08, 09. Yeah, 07 to 09. You know, it's 51%, which is ugly. You know, but the 90-10, I mean, 45.5% ain't exactly a picnic. So, you know, maybe it's not a huge difference and, and you make more money in the end. Let's, uh, though, let's go to uh, look at one more. We'll do an 80-20 portfolio just to compare it and analyze it. And yeah, it's down even further. So we've got 1.6 for the all stock. We'll call it 1.5 for the 90-10 um, uh, portfolio and 1.3 for... Uh, the 80-20. Now, at this point, though, you can see the max drawdown, still the same time period, but, you know, I would say losing 51% versus 40, roughly 40%, you know, is, is a difference. I mean, certainly losing 40%, at least in, on paper, is not fun, uh, but, you know, that, that's, that's a difference, but so is 1.6 million versus 1.3, and at this point, you may be saying, well, Rob, this just sounds like we should go all stocks. Well, I, I want to make an adjustment. Rather than starting in 1972, let's start uh, in 1999, and we'll go, we'll go to 2013. Now let's analyze the portfolio. What do we have? Well, everything is flipped. The all-stock portfolio is at 22,000. The 90-10 portfolio is at 23. The 80-20 is at 23,700. Uh, 23, um, and you can see it in the corresponding compound annual growth rate. And um, so the point here I want to make is that while over the long period, say all the way back from to, to 1926 with the Vanguard data, or 1972, which we were looking at just a minute ago, yeah, stocks win. But over long, shorter but still long periods of time, you can, you can find periods where 100% uh, stock portfolio actually loses out. And we're talking here from 1999 to 2014, not exactly a short period of time, and actually, we could probably extend this. Let's go to 20, eh, let's try 2019. Analyze that portfolio. They're basically neck and neck. I guess the all stock portfolio outperformed by a few hundred bucks, but we're talking basically two decades. And in fact, if we just go back one year, I'm gonna guess the all stock portfolio doesn't win out. No, it doesn't. Again, they're all very close. They're all 32,000 and change. But here you've got an 80-20 portfolio. You've got a drawdown, max drawdown, that's a lot lower than the 100% stock portfolio. It's still a fairly long period of time. I mean, two decades, you know, you, you, you go to sleep and you're 20, you wake up and you're 40. I mean, it's, you know, it's still a fairly long period of time. And 100% stock portfolio hasn't outperformed. Now, again, if you add international, maybe some, some additional small cap, maybe some REITs, Maybe we could construct a portfolio that would do, do better. But the point is, because of things like the tech bubble crash and the, the financial crisis in 07, 08, and 09 that really hurt stocks, and, and those things just happen. They happen periodically, and they'll continue to happen. Um, you will see periods where 100% stock portfolio doesn't actually outperform. And that's something to keep in mind. Now, one thing I always say when you're looking at historical data, we, we started with a lump sum. If you're accumulating, you know, you haven't retired yet, you want to add a fixed amount that you're going to contribute each month. Your numbers will vary, of course, but I'll put in $500 monthly. I'll adjust it for inflation because that really does change the results. And by the way, before we look at the results, the reason it changes the results, this is important to understand, is that in those down markets, you know, after the tech bubble, after the financial crisis, if you're contributing 100 bucks a month, 200 bucks a month, 500, 1,000, whatever, you're buying at lower and lower and lower values. If we look at a scenario where we just start at the beginning of some time period with a lump sum and never add to it, we're not getting the benefit of those contributions at lower values. And I think for folks that are, you know, still in their working years, you're con probably contributing, you know, each month or each quarter or each each year. So it's kind of important to model that as well. So that's what we're doing. And if we do that, again, we're looking um, uh, from, this is now from January 1999 to December 2018. 
We started with $10,000. We're adding $500 a month adjusted for inflation. And we come down. And so in this case, the all stock portfolio has one out, not by a huge amount, but it has one out, uh, 381 versus 371 and 360. We could probably go back a couple of years. Let's try 2015 and see what we get. Uh, so it's closer, but stocks have still won out by a few thousand dollars. And if we go back, eh, let's try two more years and then see what we get. So here it's really close. The, the, the 90 10 portfolio is almost identical, a couple hundred bucks difference in the final balance. You do get a, a slightly less volatile uh, max drawdown. And even the 80 20 has done extremely well. Uh, at your couple thousand, fifteen hundred bucks, maybe lower. Your max drawdown is a lot lower. So, I point that out. I was there were probably times when I was close to 100% stocks. I, I just, I just wasn't a big believer in it. So most of the time when I was when we were accumulating, and we kind of still are a little bit, but we were 90-10. Obviously, you have to make the decision for yourself. I wanted to show you the data, and uh, I think this is sort of a good exercise. Portfolio Visualizer, I have the paid version, but I think what I'm not even signed in. So what I just did, you could do uh, for free and run your own scenarios and just give it some real thought, uh, you know, in terms of your financial goals, your, you know, your ability to tolerate volatility and so on. Um, and then, you know, make the best decision you can, keeping in mind that you can always change your allocation. I just prefer not to change it when the market's either going sky high or crashing. I like to, if I'm going to make changes, I like to do them in, in calm, calm weather. Um, uh, that way I know I'm not really motivated by the emotions of a, of a, of a falling or, or rising market. All right, so that's if you have a long time uh, to invest. What about folks that are nearing retirement or are in retirement? Is there a case to be made for a 100% stock portfolio? Well, let me uh, show you two, two things. We're going to start with um, this uh, paper. This is the 1994 paper that Bill Bingen published that gave us the 4% rule. And you can see here in figure two, and let me see if I can make it even a little bigger for you. There we go. And maybe hide the sidebar if I can. There we go. So in this, he looked at different asset allocations. You can see it down below, 0% uh, stocks all the way to 100%. And that's what each bar in, uh, represents, the one on the far left, uh, is 0% stocks, one on the far right is 100% stocks. And then the, the percentages down here are the initial withdrawal rate that then gets adjusted for inflation throughout retirement. And here you can see the 4% uh, withdrawal rate is right here. And you can see that a 50-50 a stock allocation did the best. This is measuring in years, how long would the portfolio uh, last and the way he did that was basically this is how long the portfolio would last if you retired in the absolute worst year that he evaluated. It turned out to be 1966. Uh, and here's this. The next one is a 75 stocks, 25 percent bonds. And you can see this final one is 100 percent stocks. It did OK, but it didn't quite last 30 years. It's hard to tell exactly. It looks like it's around 25 to 28 years, maybe. And it was for that reason uh, that Bill Bingen concluded you really need to be somewhere between 25% stocks, excuse me, 50% stocks and 75% stocks. He later kind of refined that to maybe a 60-40 portfolio. Now that's just one data point. I want to show you another article that's more recent and it's by a professor, Estrada, he's out of Spain. And the article is The Retirement Glide Path, an International Perspective. And this article is important. What I want to actually do, first of all, let me talk about glide path just briefly. Uh, it's a very easy concept, and I'm going to go to the digital whiteboard. So if you think about our investing lives, uh, we'll say over here we're 20. Uh, here, you know, we're going to retire at 65, and then we're going to go to that great big mutual fund in the sky at 95. And uh, here is stock allocations, right? So this would be 100% stocks. And down here would be 0%. So the basic idea, I think for most, they call it life cycle investing. The idea is you're up here somewhere when you're younger, maybe 90% stocks is what most target date retirement funds uh, use, but whatever. And as you get closer and closer to retirement, you start to get more and more conservative. And then you hit retirement and you're at whatever. You could be at 60-40. You could be at 50-50. 
But the point is, you're a lot more conservative. And then once you retire, this is retirement, uh, what happens? Well, I think in most cases, this was what Bengen used. He used what's called a static glide path. You just, you coast out, you're done. And you stick to whatever allocation you have. Let's say 60, we'll call it 60-40. So we'll say this is a 60% stock graph or, or line. Um, but, but that's not the only option. You can have what's called a rising equity glide path in retirement, where believe it or not, your exposure to stocks actually goes up. It seems contrary to probably what you've read and heard and believe, but there are there's literature that suggests that's a, a good way to go. And then there's declining equity glide path, which, you know, just as the name suggests, you don't you don't go to static when you retire. You keep getting more and more conservative, right? All right. The reason I go into glide path, and I'm actually going to do more videos on it in the future, but the reason I went I, I showed you that is because that's what his paper is doing. He's looking at different glide paths, and he looks at it across returns data internationally, not just in the U.S., uh, but he looked at a number of, I think, 19 different countries, and he, he looked at rolling retirement periods going all the way back to 1900. Uh, so he looked at a total of 81 different rolling retirement periods, and he looked at static glide paths, where once you hit retirement, your asset allocation didn't change. Uh, he looked at uh, glide paths where you had more exposure to equity uh, through retirement, rising equity, and then he looked at declining equity. So what did he find? Well, I'm going to show you a couple of things briefly. Uh, the first thing he found was that in terms of declining equity uh, glide paths versus uh, rising equity glide paths, and let me get to the chart. Here we go. Here it is. Um, just to tell you what this means, 100 to zero means you start at 100% equities and you, you slowly go down. Zero to 100 means you start 0% equities, 100% bonds in retirement, and you slowly increase your, your stock exposure up to 100. And these are the same thing with just different starting percentages. And the first thing he found was that declining equity glide paths outperform rising equity glide paths. What you're seeing in these numbers here, here's 8.6 on the far right, but let's go over to the far left. 8.6 is the failure rate. He used a Monte Carlo uh, simulation. Uh, and so when you look at the declining, uh, it, it beat the rising with the same percentages here. The declining starting at 90.10 beat the, the rising that started at 10.90. And it, the same is true all the way across. Um, and so what he found was that a declining a glide path outperformed a rising glide path. Now, at this point, you're saying, that's great, Rob, but what's this got to do with 100% stocks in retirement? Well, I'm glad you asked, because he, he, he had two other interesting conclusions. The first is, he looked at static uh, glide paths, right, where it doesn't change through retirement, and what he found in terms of, you know, the likelihood of success uh, in retirement, meaning you don't run out of money, he found 60-40 was the best, uh, the most likely to succeed, and I'll show you the numbers. And just to interpret this, 60 times 30 right here, that means 60% stocks for a 30-year retirement. This, uh, this right here is the best result he could get with declining equities. It was a 6.2% failure rate. The best he could find if you increased your equities in retirement, a 14.5% uh, failure rate. But the 60-40 had just 4.9. That was the best. And it left a lot of money. The, the, these figures down here, he used a $1,000 starting portfolio balance. Of course, the actual amount doesn't matter. But he found that the 60-40 was not only great in terms of a reduced failure rate. It was also really good in terms of how much money you had when you died, if that's important to you, to leave to your heirs and, and perhaps charity. And again, I hear you asking, that's great, Rob, but where's the 100% stock allocation? Well, here we go. He actually looked at 100% stocks, and you can see right here. Why not 100% stocks? And what he found was that it was actually the best result of all of the things that he considered. And I can show you, I think he did a table for this. Yes, here it is. So remember, over here is our 60 our 60% stocks that had a 4.9% failure rate. But look over here, his 100% stock had a failure rate of just 3.7%. And look at all of the money it had left over. 
the mean, the median. This is uh, the most in like the, the sort of the extreme tail. You could have $11,800 for every $1,000 you started with. Um, but that's an extreme case. But the point is, he found the failure rate was the lowest and you had the most left over um, when you die. Now, having said all of that, I point that out because I want to share this information with you as I find it. He points out in the article that it's probably going to be very, very difficult for a retiree to actually have a 100% stock portfolio, just psychologically with market crashes down 50% or more, you know, when you're relying on your nest egg, it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult, unless maybe you've got so much money, you can live off of one or 2% of your portfolio. If that's the case, maybe, but if not, I kind of agree with them. I don't know that I could stomach a 100% stock portfolio, but there is at least an argument, and I will leave a link to this paper uh, below the video, there is at least an argument that in retirement, a 100% stock portfolio might not be a terrible idea. That's the, that's the most I can say for it. Now, I think another interesting question, and one that I'm going to be considering myself will have future videos on, is this. His sort of second place portfolio was 60-40. Now this paper was written a couple of years ago, published in, I think 20, was it 14? 2015. Is a 60-40 portfolio still a great option given low bond yields? That's an interesting question. And I'm gonna be doing my own research on that, but it's something to keep in mind and to start considering for yourself. Uh, for those of you that are near or in retirement as you think about your own asset allocation. But yes, there's a, at least an argument that a 100% stock portfolio could be justified even for retirees. I just don't think for this retiree, I don't think I can stomach it. But there you go. Have any questions, comments, leave them below the video. I'll do my best to help you out any way I can. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.